Tag is Marriott Crack, C-R-A-C-H-T. Zip three is Bobby Kaufman, K-A-U-F-M-A-N. The city is Miami Beach. And Florida, USA, the land is green. This is roll number one. Today is May 1st, 1995. My name is Bobby Kaufman. I'm interviewing the survivor, Miriam Track. We're in Miami Beach, Florida. Good morning, Miriam. Good morning. Thank you for agreeing to do this. Okay. Could you please state your name? My name is Miriam Track. I spell it M I R I A M T R A C H T, Track. I was born July 15. 1926 in Benjin, Europe, that was Poland. Could you spell the city? How would you spell Benjin? Uh, B-E-N-D-Z-I-N. Is it near another big town? Yes, near Katowice. K-A-T-O-V-I-C-E. Katowice. And what was your name at birth? Mariam. And your last name at birth? Fireman. F-A-Y-E-R-M-A-N. I see. Do, and your Hebrew name? Mariam. Uh, I would spell it M-A-R-I-A-M. Mariam. And what did they call you? In Polish, they called me Marysia. M-A-R-Y-S-I-A. What did your parents call you? Marysia. Miriam. Depends. And in school? Marysia. Marysia. Where did you go to school? In Poland, it was Brodowie. B-R-O-Y-D-O-V-E-Y. Brodowie. That was a public school. Did you have a, a Jewish education also? Yes. I went to Bat Yaakov. After my uh, regular school, that was a Jewish school. Where we went there for Hebrew. Jewish, Hebrew and for Jewish history. And who went with you? We all went in different times, like my other sisters and brothers also attended a Hebrew school after the regular school. Did the boys and girls go to the same school? No, they did not. Separate. It was an Orthodox place, although we were not Orthodox, actually. But we followed the rules. Tell me about that. Well, for instance, my mother had beautiful black long hair, but our neighbors in my tenement were orthodox. So just to please them, she put on a wig, which was she was not very comfortable with it many times. But she did it. She was a great person. My mother was um, a registered nurse and she worked for the Red Cross and used to take me along because as a little girl I learned to play mandolin and I cheered all those sick people. They always asked for me if she did not take me along. That's what I do now, I take my daughter along with me and we do charities and win awards. How many brothers and sisters did you have? Four sisters and two brothers. We were six children. My older sister was Helen, Hava, Itzhak, Pincus, Regina, and Miriam, me. Tell me about your father. My father was a great, a beautiful man, but he worked very hard. He was an artist engraver on monuments, um, granite monuments, all kind, kind of colors in it. He worked very hard. Since we were six children, he worked about three jobs each time. And um, it was it it was would be a beautiful life, but we were really annoyed with anti-Semitism. As a young girl, I already experienced this. I had beautiful long hair. I show you the pictures later, and uh, and they would throw in you know some kind some kind of um, I have it to show it to you here. I picked it on the ground something into my hair that would be hurting me and was hard to get out for my mother. She would have to cut each time some of my braids to get this stuff. It was pinching and hurting. I show you, I have it here, what that was. 
Where did this happen? At school or outside? After going from school, you know, or we went down on the street, I lived on Szelacka Dziesięć. That was my house number. And um, one time, you know, um, during the, during the, uh, before we went to the ghetto, but we could not attend our Batyakov school anymore. So we had a private uh, rabbi teacher come to our house. One time he did not come. And we called up his wife and she said that a man, a Paul, with, with a wagon and horse, hit him with that, uh, what you call this, with the... A stick or switch? Or with the... Whip. With the whip and got his whole face scarred with blood and one eye of his was closed. He did it because he had a beard, my teacher, and he looked Jewish. There was very great anti-Semitism in Benjamin, where I was. And that was annoying me because we lived in a tenement with non-Jews too, and we got along so beautifully. My mother would always bake cakes and holly cookies and give it to them. They loved us, but on the outside of this tenement, it was great anti-Semitism. For instance, um, if, you want, if you want me to talk when the Germans came in. Please. When the Germans came in, uh, the Poles right away worked together with the Germans to show them where the Jews lived and which houses. And they took out some of our friends we don't know where they took them, but they have never been seen again. And the people that had beards to show they were Jewish were lying the next day dead on the streets or in pools of blood. And as a little gentle girl, you know, I was so shocked with such a brutality, I couldn't understand. But we still believed that maybe it wouldn't be so like that. Meantime, when the Germans came in, the poles lined up with flowers, and like nothing ever happened. And we Jewish people, we thought we lost our country now, that something is happening to us, and we were so upset. And uh, after that were long lines for bread, the second day. And, and as we stood in the lines for bread, we used to get up 4 o'clock, 4 a.m. in the morning. The bakers were Jewish. They opened the place uh, six, seven, but we lined up at four. And uh, as we stood in the line, ready all ready to come for that, for that bread, Pauls would go over to the gendarme that stood on the outside to the German and say, she is Jewish. So he hit me, you know, with, with his um, uh, gun. You Jew, you there, get out of the, of, of the line. So I lined up in another line again. They did it to all Jewish people because the Poles told them we are Jewish. Otherwise, they would know. The Germans wouldn't know. Well, how they differed, the Poles, from us, they had, you know, they looked more farmish. And we looked more like we are from a state, you know, always so clean, nice clad. And um, our complexions were also darker most of us, you know, as Jewish people. And so they, they told the Germans where is a Jew, where a Jew lives, in which tenement. They were taken out and never seen again. That was very shocky to me because it, to me it was something new, what's going on around me. Like I thought, I'm Jewish, I'm not supposed to be Jewish, or I didn't know what's going on. Then, then they put yellow stars on us. So we wore the stars to really identify us as Jews walking the streets. So many times we saw uh, soldiers or other Germans passing by and they just pushed us down off the street. It was something new to me. I used to come home and cry. And um, then they, um, they created a ghetto where they put us all in the ghetto so they know 
First, they rounded us up before we went to the ghetto in our tenements. They knocked at the doors and took out my sisters and brothers to camp. Some of them, you know, to try the ovens in Auschwitz, in Birkenau. So they took out the Jewish people to murder them. To us, they would say that our people are being relocated somewhere for work. And we believed them because, you know, Jews usually are not violent and, and were not brought up in such a manner. So we believed them. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been so, you know, um, so how they say, uh, doing what they did to us, killing us like that. Because we would, we would stand up to it. And so um, in the ghetto, they gave us a card, a pink card. They called it in German a Zonder. With this pink card, we would go to work from the ghetto with this card to work to the city. Where and where who did not? Ghetto? Where was the ghetto? In, in somewhere on the farming area past the city. In past Benjin. the city, in Benjin, yeah. They, they told the Poles, you know, to get out and occupy our houses, and we went into the ghetto there. There were no lights, because there were some f farmhouses, no lights, and uh, no stoves, and the, the water we had to take from, you know, pumps, we lived a very horrified life over there. And why they gathered us up to be able to, to get us out and kill us, you know, then we were all together, the Jews. So I remember taking off sometimes that yellow band that said you there, that I'm Jewish, and tried, you know, to maybe to hide, to look at some poles that maybe they would take me in with my, uh, some uh, sisters and brothers were already taken out and sent to camps. I, rem I rem uh, reminded with, um, remained with my sister uh, Hava, and with my mother. So I went to a woman, to a Polish woman. I took off my star and I asked her, would she take us in? Because my mother used to be so nice to, uh, to her. She would help us out in, in domestic work. And my, my mother would always give her clothes and, and food. She said, me, she would take in. But she wouldn't take in my mother and Hava, my sister. So I said, well, I cannot do that, so thank you anyway. And in the ghetto, they were coming all the time to pick some people and take them to Auschwitz. We didn't know where they are taking them, but you know, we never saw them again. So we, in the closet, we made um, a hole going down to the basement, covered with clothing and closet, that they would know where we are, and we used to hide there. So I remember one time they came in always uh, when it was dark to get us. And they came in and they looked around. They didn't see us because we ran down to the basement. And the German yelled, I hear you, Juden. I hear you, Jews. Get out of there. And he and he sh shot into that hall, and he shot my cousin into his arm. And we were slowly going out from, from the hiding place. He says, where is a shovel here? And in front of his mother and father, he shot my cousin Moshe. He says, with the shovel you build, I build a grave. And after that, they lined us up to take us to Auschwitz to Birkenau and to Auschwitz. And uh, I remember the, there was, uh, bi uh, what you say, in, in big halls and places they lined us up without water, without anything. And we had to wait for the cattle trains to take us to Birkenau. And in the train, in, but in before those- Before we do that, let's talk a little more about the ghetto. Okay. Yeah. You were talking about the pink card, the work card. A zonder, cards? yes. That who had this card? Uh, for a while, they were working 
in factories. What we did for the Germans, like on, on clothing for the soldiers, we sewed, uh, we uh, like uh, put on buttons and make, make buttons. So I learned then how to sew, and I was lucky, you know, that I was not a send away right away. And after a while, as I said, they lined us up and they, they took us all. Were you allowed to leave the ghetto each day to work? Just to work, yes. How, what did the ghetto look like? Was there a wall around the ghetto or? No wall, like empty land. Just we were scattered into those little houses, farmhouses. How and each time we went out to work, we saw many people lying dead, killed in pools of blood. Perhaps they tried to run, I don't know. And it was very horrifying to us. But we got so used to it, you know, that that was like a every day's happening. They also, before I remember we went to the ghetto, they burned down our synagogue. The synagogue was so beautiful with special paintings from Jewish artists from Warsaw, with gorgeous ornaments. And on the street lie dead people, worshipers, all in pools of blood. And I passed by and I cried so much. It was just, life was horrible. And the Poles worked together with the Germans. That was, was unbelievable why they did that. Unbelievable. Well, later when we went to those um, who cannot walk, they, they shot them over there. And then we went on those trains, on the cattle trains. Wait, before we talk about that, there's, there's more. Um, who was with you in the ghetto? Who, was your entire family together? No, some of them were already rounded up and sent away to camps. And your father? All sent away. Just I remained there with some families, like you know, uh, what we were together in one in one house, in a farmhouse, together with cousins and my mother, and my sister Hava, Ava. Yeah. What did you eat? How did you have food? We did not have much food, but uh, they gave us uh, some cards for food because we worked for them for the Germans. Nothing extravagant, you know. Whatever we, we had, we ate. How old were you? When the Germans came and I was 13 years old. In the ghetto, how old were you in the ghetto? Uh, 15. How long were you in the ghetto? Two years. Did you play music in the ghetto? No. In the ghetto I did not play. I used to go out with my mother, who was a nurse. She took me along to play for the people, you know, to make them happy. She used to sing for them. She was a great pianist. So in, in those cattle trains, we were so close to one another with all kinds of strange people. Children were crying. We couldn't even lift their arm. And some people, you know, they couldn't go to the toilet, so they just did it as they stood. They did that. And for hours and hours, you know, we traveled in those cattle trains to Auschwitz. And then when we arrived. Wait, let's talk about the transport, being on the train. What time of year was it? Was it was cattle train. Okay. It was in the fall, I remember. Was it cold? Yes. Not, not very cold, but it was already chilly wet, yes. Did they take your names? Were you registered in any way when you got on the train? No, just like cattle, they threw us on the train. Rouse, rouse, up there, children, everybody. But, you know, after a long time, there was nothing to drink, not even a little water. After we arrived to Birkenau, it was many hours. The driver was a poor at the at this train. And when we arrived, they, they yelled, you know, Germans stood there in Birkenau with uh, weapons, with long carabins and dogs, police dogs. And they yelled, 
rouse, rouse from the train. And they hit us, too, you know. We had to step down, get out of there. And they then started rounding us up. The children, they said, on this side, it was, it was very horrible why Germans would do something to people that almost spoke their own language. You could understand German, and they could understand us, Jewish. And then the children were, wanted to stay with their mothers. So some mothers went with the children, and some tried to get away. But the, of course, the children cried, and the mothers went along with them. Why to be did the killed. mothers try to get away? They knew that was something wrong. And you know, everybody's afraid of death. So most of the people went with their children on the children's uh, buses. But uh, some were scared, and they tried to get away to the other side, where there were no children and old people. Did, did anyone try to warn you, or did anyone speak to you to try to tell you what to do to no. help you? No. But I tell you what I remember now, that in the ghetto while we were, one man came and said, I come from Auschwitz. And he showed us a number like I had was on his arm. He said, they are killing our people there. Try to hide, don't go there. We thought he was hysterical. We couldn't, we couldn't understand what he means. But later we knew. Did you have any other outside news in the ghetto? Was there a radio or anything? Oh, no. If they caught you with a radio, they shot them right away. You couldn't have no radios, nothing. Did your family? They took everything away from us. All the radios, silver, gold. And they even told us, you know, to bring all our beautiful stuff, what we have, because they're going to relocate us. So as difficult as it was for us, we were hungry and all, and we carried suitcases of nice, beautiful stuff later just to give it to them. They took it away from us. What did you bring? Like silks, you know, beautiful dresses, blouses, materials, everything. So they just made us, you know, bring it for them. Real devils, how they worked. And to the Poles, they probably gave some stuff that they didn't care for. Therefore, they worked with the Poles together. Poles, Ukrainians, Lithuanians, non-Jews did a great part in exterminating us. For instance, they murdered my whole, my, my husband's family. And the, and the Ukrainians even helped them to dig graves. The whole family was shot into graves. And my husband was all blood when he escaped from that. When, they, when he heard quiet, he escaped from the, some were even covered up with dirt, they were still alive. Did any non-Jewish people ever try to help you at this time? No. I hear that there was, as I told you, the, the, our maid, she was a helper. She wanted to hide me, but not my mother and not my sister and I didn't want to go for it. But later, when I was in Auschwitz, and I saw what they are doing every day, they exterminating us, taking us out to be burned. I said, oh my God, at least I would have been in Steffi's house, at least. When you arrived at Auschwitz? We went to the other side, not where the old people, not where the children, because my mother was still young, and my sister, Hava, Ava, was young, and I was young. So we were, uh, you know, uh, put to the other side to go to work, to come to Birkenau to work. All the other children and old people, they just took away, you know, to be killed. And we, who, who could not work? They just shut them there. And there, then we saw people from the camp with, uh, with, the clo with their special clothing, with stripes. And they were helping to line up the very old that couldn't walk to the buses and the ones that were shot. They lined them up on, on the stretches to take them away. To us, it was something unusual. They, they couldn't talk. They were afraid to talk. They worked within the camps. What time of day did you arrive? 
late in the afternoon, almost evening. And when, when we went, finally, we, when we went you, into the uh, barracks, they told us to get undressed completely and give everything away, get undressed. And I forgot to take off my pierced, I had little diamond earrings, and I forgot about them. So he hit me on the head and the blood was coming down all, I still have a sign, all through my face. And then they took us to, to uh, rooms to be shorn our hairs off, and the next day we got uh, tattoos. What was that like? We were frightened to death, but my mother got a tattoo, my sister Hava and I had a tattoo. We looked so funny without the hair and naked. Then we went back to our barracks, and what we saw is that the prisoners there, they had a little hair already grown back on them. They would put their hands into, into their hair and took out bunches of lice and threw it on the floor. Oh I, my God, we couldn't believe where we are. We saw something very horrifying is going on. Because as I said later, those barracks, everything must have been built by a devil that couldn't be a human being doing things like that. One was on top, one bed made of wood, you know, hard, was on top of the other. We slept three. And then they told us two days later, after we had already the numbers on our arms, it's time to go out. Every time we went to appeal, and they read our num numbers. Okay, let's stop and then we'll talk about that. Too. Mary? My sister, I want to tell you something about my sister Hava. You know, she was a poetess. She wrote beautiful poems to a magazine which appeared every week, once a week. But she couldn't say her name was Hava. So on the bottom of the magazine it says, by Evita, because she couldn't say she was Jewish. That was the shock, because they would never print her poems. She was Jewish. Miriam, tell I didn't me tell you. I didn't tell you about what happened in Auschwitz when they told us to go out the second day after they put our numbers down. And so they told us to round up everybody out from the barracks and round up on the street, Mengele had to come. He stood before us like I would see him now. And uh, then they said, get undressed. We had no hair on. Can you imagine how we looked? What and only wearing? thing, my sister and my mother, they were wearing glasses. But they were young people, right? Looks like Mengele did not like glasses on people. Maybe he figured out that they wouldn't work right. They would need they will need glasses. He himself wore glasses. So what did he do? The people that didn't appeal to him or wore glasses, he told the German uh, women, the soldiers, they were soldiers, German w women, to bring those people that he pointed out to this side. It was a big field outside of the barracks. We went out. And I was told to go this way with other people. And I wanted to run to my sister and to my mother. And she hit me with the gun on the face. So I went back there. I understood right away that something is wrong. She doesn't let me go there. And then a young, a young girl who recognized me later here in the United States, she said, what, what, so frightened? 
I said, come on my site. She went on my site. Do you know that after the war, we were here in Miami Beach. She came from Canada at the Delito Hotel. She says to me, is your name Marisha? I said, yes. She said, I never forget you because you saved my life. I never took her address. It would have been very helpful to me. I knew she was from Canada, from Montreal. At least I saved somebody's life. But you know what? After that, they wrote down the numbers from this site where my mother was and Hava. They didn't write down my number. And later, I didn't understand still because they let us get together, again to the barracks. I said, oh, thanks to God, we are together again. But no, two days later, they called up the numbers they wrote down to go outside. And my mother said, you tell the world if you survive. Don't forget, pray to God, you will survive. And I remember a woman fainted, and they couldn't pick her up to be killed. They threw her back in, the gar in, in our barracks. Later I said, oh, how if my mother fainted, she would still be alive with my sister Hava. And my sister, my mother knew they are going to be killed. All you smelled is smoke after a couple of hours. Smoke, the air was dark from smoke. I said, oh my God, my mother, my sister Hava are being murdered now. And then, of course, I remain alone with the other prisoners. And I used to sing for them. But since then, I have a traumatic voice. I cannot sing, but I still play mandolin. And I remember it, it, that uh, after we worked for them, sewing over there like we did in the ghetto, sewing soldiers' stuff in the barracks. There were machines. We sewed by hand. I sewed. And they said, who would want to go to uh, Auschwitz? This was Birkenau. There is factories, ammunition factories. I didn't know what's that all about, but I didn't, I didn't sign up. Well, you go outside. They looked me over. You go, you go, you go, you go. So I was picked to go to Auschwitz to work in an ammunition factory. What was the? We had to put pieces of iron that were soaked in chemicals into a machine, but you had to do it real fast because that the top of the machine was going down swiftly. So you had to pick up those, and you made round, round ammunition stuff. I don't know what it is. It's ammunition, part of ammunition. And I remember um, one of my friends that stood next to me had two fingers chapped off. Her name was Viera. But I was careful. But you're, and the Ukraine um, foreman was going around us with the woman, the soldier woman, to see how we work. So all we had to do, pick up those, the pieces of iron, put it in the machine, press down on this presser, and one, go like this. They have no right to lift up your head. Just go like this every second for eight hours. Go like this. One time, the machine got stuck, my machine. As I told you, my friend had fingers chopped off. I don't know about others. So I said, now I'm going to get it. He's going to take us out. That the Ukraine, he was a Gestapo. How do we recognize he had a dead, a dead uh, emblem on his head? And I said, now, I said goodbye to Viera to all of them. I have, look what I did. I'm af that was after a long time I worked like this. He's going to kill me now. So I went over to another foreman, a German, who worked there from Germany. I said, bitte, bitte, can you help me? Can you talk with the foreman? I said, I made such a mistake. I didn't mean to do that. I'm a good worker. Can, can you spare me that he shouldn't kill me? He says, no. Come on, he says, go into his room over there across. You beg him, you go. 
I said, thank you, thank you. And I go, I go in, away from the machines that got stuck. And I said, please, please, I said, can you forgive me? I just, I said, you know I'm a good worker. You watch me every day. And now the machine got stuck. I said, please don't kill me, I promise you. I'm gonna even work much better. I will work so good. He looked at me and a woman sat next to him on a chair. He says, what do you think you did? I don't believe you. You did that spitefully like this. He hit me on the face. You did that spitefully. I says, please, I didn't do it. Please, please. You see, I'm going to work so good. He says, OK, go. I went in there. He was a foreman, but he, a Ukraine, but he had knowledge of fixing the machines. Although he was in a uniform as a Gestapo, and I saw him, he says, go away, go away. I stood aside, and he started fixing back the machine, taking out the things and fixing. Go, work. And I worked, I tell you. I didn't even know anything, just quicker than I want to, want to, want to just like this, crazy. I thought I'm in an insane place, but I had to do it not to be shot dead. I know already they killed my other family. Some of my family is in the camps. I didn't know anything if they live or not. So what happened, do you know what? He sent the woman by, he sent the woman by that soldier woman with a drink of soup for me. And the soup was, you know, watery soup. Just said, I'm a good worker. But next time he said, you go to the Himmel Commando. You go to up there. If you once again, you do that. I said, God, if I have to do it, I better have, please, cut my fingers, do anything, but don't let me do that again. I was afraid of him. Then, as we came back to the barracks, after the working in, in the ammunition factory, uh, one commandant yelled out, who of you can play an instrument, musical instrument? You know what they, they stole, they took away from the Jews, everything, you know, instruments, my mandolins that belonged to my brother Yitzhak. But uh, they had mandolins, they had a piano, they had guitars. The, he says, okay, you line up. Who plays an instrument? I lined up. I know I'm a good mandolinist. Because during the ghetto times, uh, I went to school for notes. And I also went when my, when my education was disrupted. There was a professor, Statler, who spelled S-T-A-T-T-L-E-R, who gave private lessons. And I went there too for private lessons. Of course, till they, till they send us away. So he said he's going to interview us, the commandant. So although they, some people were hanged over there, you know, who received a piece of bread from outside because some workers came from outside. So they, they hung them in front of us. See, if you accept anything from outside, that's where you're going to be. But he looked up. He, he did not exactly hang them. He made the other people hang them. But this was the one organized musicians. He listens to some people. He said, no, Rose, no good, no good. He listened to me. He says, yes, I am accepted. So after that, I had to stay less on the outside where it was freezing, just, you know, being dressed in, that, in this striped uniform. No sweat is nothing. My hands were frozen to the third degree. I was surprised how I could play my mandolin. See, I was young, so still I could do it. And maybe that's what, I, what they took us to play, instruments. We stood less on the outside, and the, they called them appeals, where they round us up just to stay. And if somebody didn't stray straight, the couple would go over and hit them on the face. Why did you turn? There was Maria. She was in Auschwitz for being a prostitute. The Germans 
sent her there. But she was our, uh, our couple. She used to beat us up, I tell you, what we went through. They asked later, why, when we worked together with the Germans, you know, that were just working there in the factories, why do they kill us like this? And they, they said, listen, that, 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 that what, what it is, uh, how they say the law, they have to do it, that's all. He didn't know why, that's it. So we worked hungry, we were skinny, we walked out the barracks at night, you saw piles of dead people that the hunger got them to have holes in their bodies. All you saw is lying skeletons with the teeth out, real skeletons. And when I walked through the barrack, one of the soldiers grabbed me. Come on, pile up some. I ran away. So he hit me, but I ran away to another barrack. I didn't want to touch those dead people. And then we were hungry. All we did get is one piece of bread for the whole day, a small piece of bread and some soup they called chai. That was not really soup. It was made of some kind of, I don't know, grass or something. It tasted like the most ugliest taste of tea. And that was our food. And occasionally you, they, they threw in, when the transports came, the Jews from Romania, and they carried their foods in containers, so they, they threw a piece of salami to us, a piece of cheese. And I went out where the Poles were, the barracks. The Polish people had also uh, numbers on their hands, but they didn't have the, see, that little star. Only Jews were getting that little star to be identified as a Jew prisoner. They had also numbers, the Poles. And I would say to them, you have a piece of cheese today for me. You got a piece, a slice of cheese. They didn't like the cheese that had a smelly odor. So sometimes they threw a piece of cheese at me. But I remember they were, they were sent, the Poles were sent to Auschwitz with the Ukrainian, you know, girls for different methods, not because they were Jews, but they did something wrong, whether for prostitution or what. And we were sent there just because we're Jews. We were sent there to be destroyed, killed. And many times um, we thought, and who couldn't, uh, who couldn't uh, survive like they were sick? Right away they took them out to be guests with the new transport. I remember one time I got hit, you know, by the couple, and she threw me in one of those, those rooms. So I said, my God, I turned around, besides having a bloody head again, twice I was hit for not taking off the earrings, the second time, I said, what am I doing here to be, maybe to go up and smoke? I ran out from there, I ran back to my, I ran back to my, uh, you know, uh, barrack. So I was between life and death so many times, I don't know how I survived. Because you know, when the, when the Russians were approaching to Auschwitz, we saw red skies and we heard such noises like they were bombarding. I said, you know, God, please let them, let them throw bombs on us because the Germans will be killed too with us together. I said, let's be an end to that suffering. But somehow we survived. And they said to us, you're gonna be going on a transport now. They opened big holes with clothing that they took away from the arrivals. Each time, a few times a day, people arrived from Hungary, Jews, from Budapest, from all over Europe, from France, from Holland, people arrived. So you know, there was a lot of clothing, the good clothing they, and teeth that they pulled out from people, long hair that was sent to Germany. But uh, the, the clothing that was not so perfect, they said, now we're gonna go to a transport. 
we were going to Ravensbrück. Before because we talk about that, let's talk a little more about your experiences in Auschwitz. When you were chosen. Well, when in Auschwitz, who couldn't make it anymore, they were, when we entered Auschwitz, in front was uh, made of iron, was made, were made words, Arbeit macht frei. Work will make you free. And we wish to joke, yeah, yeah. Arbeit macht frei. Crematorium, Eis weit drei. Means, yeah, we're gonna be freed in a crematorium. Who are we even joking about it? And he could, who couldn't work anymore, or couldn't do any more work, because we were so hungry, skinny. We were very skinny and hungry and cold. So they embraced the electrical wires. Every time we went there or we went back from war, we saw dead people just next to the wires. That was in Auschwitz. That was suffering. From Auschwitz, we were marched back. Let's Many see. times I wanted, as we, walked, as we walked from Auschwitz, we walked through, uh, you know, where trains were going, and, and I figured now I'm going to jump down there many times, but as you know, the SS with the dogs and their carabins were not far from us, many of them. And as I wanted to jump, I looked down, I see shot people, that they did the same idea what I had. So I said, no, I don't jump now. That was going on till 1945 like this. I don't really know how I survived. I think because I played mandolin and I was sometimes with this, the commanders in the warm, in the little warmer places, and got a little extra of the chai soup. Maybe that's how I survived. And before we went on a transport, they said, now you can go into those, to those rooms and get changed, put on anything. The soldiers ran away because they knew the truth that the Russians are coming. And some of the people that were older than I was were hiding in the, in the barracks. They didn't go, but I lined up. First, I didn't know, I was young, I didn't know anything. Those were the older ones that they said, oh, they're chasing us? No, the Russians must be coming because there's a lot of fire in the air. So I went into one of, with the other prisoners, we went in, took off our prison clothes with the stripes, and I remember seeing a beautiful little dress. And it was tied on me, although I was skinny. And I, I pushed myself into this dress. And I took shoes, and I got shoes. And now I felt I am not a prisoner altogether. I don't have that striped clothes on me. And we lined up and started walking, walking on trains and walking. Who couldn't walk was shot, was lying down there. We looked at it, it was like a every day's happening. Killed, shot. And one time as we walked out towards, the Germans said, we walk towards Ravensbrück now. So um, we, we did. We, we walked to Ravensbrück. And I was in Ravensbrück. Wait, wait. And then when the Germans started, when the Russians started coming closer, they wanted us to leave Ravensbrück and go and walk again between cattle train and walking. So this time I said, I cannot walk anymore. That was it. After they walked us further, they said, we're going to Bergen-Belsen, closer, closer to the American zone and the English zone, away from the Russian zones. Those soldiers, you know, some soldiers ran away, they disappeared. They knew that's the end of the war. We didn't know that. So as we walked again from Ravens Ravensbrück, hours and hours hungry, and it was the end of March. It was April, almost April. And I, I see I cannot walk anymore, and we walk and we walk, and I watched this dead, dead, dead. But I watched the gendarme with the dog that he turned around, I guess, to pick up something to eat from his, uh, he had on him, uh, uh, you know, a little suitcase. I ran across. I ran across, there were farms there. 
And as I ran across, I said, God, I'm safe. I looked from far away, they are walking. I'm safe. And I sit there in the hall, in the, in the yard. At the farm was f further in. And I sit there, a private soldier passes by over there. He says, relaxing, Fraulein? Relaxing? I said, mm-hmm, yeah. Uh, he said, pretty soon, what are you? I said, Polish, I Polish, I work for the farm. Ich, ich Arbeit farm. He says, oh, you know something? You'll be free soon. The Russians are coming in. Oh, I said, really? Like, I don't care, of course I care. And he went away. So I said, oh, that's a bad place for me to sit here in the yard. I picked myself up and I want to go out the other way again where the road is. Guess who's coming? One of those gendarmes with, with, with the rifle and with the dog. Come on over here, you. I said, yeah, me? Yeah, you. Bist du als dem transport? Are you from this transport? I said, me? Transport? Verrickt. How would you say to a soldier <laughs> with a gun, with a dog, are you crazy? Verrickt. No transport, woo. No transport. Side me thy arm. Show me your arm. I said, now I'm finished. He'll, he'll shoot me like all the others that lie dead while we walk. The dress was so tight. I tried to say he looked like a man maybe 30 years old. I was going to say, listen, you have a mother, you have sisters, let me leave, please. I'm going to say it to him. He says, oh, you not this arm, this arm, not this arm, this arm. I told my dress, what do you want? Was, was, ich arbeit farm. He says, go. So I was so many times. Between life and death, it's unbelievable. I would have been shot, there would be no more me. That's it. Because the transport was already gone. So then again, I was safe. What am I doing now? The night was approaching. I'm not going to go to the farm. I don't know the Germans. As the night was approaching, I stood in a hallway. I walked, I walked, and I find myself like it was a big brick house, and inside was a hallway. And there were doors, like people had their apartments there. And I was hungry, and I was so cold. And at least a little water, you know, I would pick up, I would pick up little grass, anything I could to eat. And I hear them talk through the, through the doors. Oh, jawohl, jawohl, the Russians, they coming, the Russians. I said, the Russians are coming. And then I said, if the door will open, what am I going to say? I know what I'm going to say. I'm going to say that I was bombarded and I don't have the farm anymore. I am, what shall I do? Maybe you give me something, a little water or what? Or give me something to eat. No, I said, that's a bad idea. I started walking again. I walk, I walked to a different farm and I walked in. I saw young people, there were Poles, Ukrainians, that were sent from their uh, home to work for the German farmers. And I said, hello. I said, yes, I'm Polka. I'm Polish. Kto ty jesteś? Oh, I'm Polish too. A ja Ukrainka. Oh, skąd ty tu? How did you come here? I said, my farmer, the German, he was bumped, I said. And I am here. You got something to eat. Give me a little bread. Give me a little water, will you? Oh, sure, come on in. Me time again. A soldier's there trying to get undressed into private clothes. He says to me, come on over, he says, you have beautiful velvet eyes. You look so beautiful. Are you Jewish? He said, Jewish? You don't know me. No. He kept on walking. How they recognized the Poles, I spoke fluently Polish. They didn't, they didn't know I was Jewish. No. They gave me bread and, right, and, and then, 
We were on this farm where the Germans put dynamite outside, so that when the Russians come in, they will be killed. And I, and I saw that all the farmers, everybody's running somewhere. I remained there. I didn't give a care anymore, dynamite or not, I don't care. But you know, before the Russians came, the Germans removed the dynamite maybe on account of the farmers, of the German farmers. So again, but I didn't run. I stood like this over there. I didn't care anymore. The Russians came in. There was another problem. First was a problem with the German soldiers, right? Now was a problem with the Russian soldiers. But you know what? I was hiding from them, hiding, so that I shouldn't be, you know, in trouble. I, I hid on an old woman's um, I sat on her bed. She was maybe 80 years old, the old woman. And I, and I hid under her covers in bed. I was so skinny and tiny that the, the soldiers wouldn't know I am over there. That's how I, you know, hid myself, not, you know, not to be in trouble. Because they're soldiers, you know, like the German soldiers. What do they want of young women, you know? Let's stop you. Good boy. Tape three. Miriam, you were saying you were hiding on a woman's bed, you were hiding from the soldiers? Yes. Because uh, what, what else I heard, you know, because over there were the workers, right? The Poles, the Ukrainians, the Lithuanians. What I heard that they took out a German woman, the Russians, took her out to the woods and they shot her. You know, that was a daughter of a, of a farmer, or she worked, a German woman. She was a beautiful woman, but the man killed her, the soldier, because he said that she made him sick. So perhaps she had a disease or something that he shot her dead, the Russian. So then again I say, this soldier, those soldiers, oh my God. But I found them to be actually very nice, very kind, the soldiers. With the exception that I was hiding as a young woman. They were nice. They would give you bread. They would help. Yeah. Where were you living? Where were you staying? In the farmer's place. The one farmer, the same farmer? Yeah, it was a big farm with many workers, Poles, Ukrainians, Lithuanians. They liked me very much, really. They what liked work me. did you do on the farm? I didn't work anymore. The Russians came. Freedom. Nothing. I didn't work. The Germans were hiding, running away. You know what happens to the Germans when the Russians came in. They had to cook for us, the Germans, to, and, and we didn't work. But I said, this is no life for me. Miriam, you have to go on moving on. You have to see who survived because before they murdered my sister, Hava, and my mother, they sent my other people, my brothers, sisters, to camps, right? Maybe somebody survived. I have to go on. So then I heard that the first trains were moving toward uh, Poland, but not regularly. Not regularly, like they moved, they stopped. So I said, now it's time for me to move on. Where am I going? I'm going to Poland. So after I arrived to Poland, the first thing I came is to see the woman that wanted to hide me, but not my mother and my sister. I said, you see, Stefa, I survived. I, th I should have at least stood with you what kind of a torment I went through between life and death. She says to me, listen, Marisha, I would have hidden all three of you, but I was scared for my neighbors. Because my mother was so nice to her, gave, gave her clothing, beside money, cakes, everything. You should see before Christmas what we did for all our neighbors, the Poles. My mother would bake day and night 
It, we were just loved in this tournament, loved among the Poles, but uh, usually they, they, they really were very anti-Semitic. For instance, in my house, there was um, my friend, she was my age, that she was always hit by her father, a Pole. And she says, how comes that your father is so kind to your mother, and my father would take the money he makes and spend that on whiskey and come and beat up my mother and beat up my brothers and sisters. Why is it like the Jewish people? She says, they are, they are such kind people, she said. My father worked three or four jobs, as I told you, to provide for the family. He was such a kind man, an artist, of course. He never beat nobody. He, he had such a, a, a mild voice. So that was the difference why the Poles were so jealous, because we lived such a, a harmonious, uh, harmonious life. And they always got drunk. And at weddings, you should see what's going on with the Poles, knifings. Knifings to death, one brother, another. It was really frightening. What, what I remember, another thing, you know, I mixed things to memorize. When I took off that yellow star and I went to see that Stefa one day, she should hide me. It was snow and slit and a German woman that was stationed in Benjamin, she couldn't even walk. So I crossed her, and she said to me, God bless you. If I knew what they would do to my sisters, brothers, I would never walk her through that slit. I, even though she was German, I figured she's in need, and I walked her down the street. If I knew, maybe I would say, you like me? She says, nice, you nice, nice child, nice. I would say, can you hide me? Do something for me. I never did. I didn't know what's going on. Did, uh, uh, did you go to your home when you returned? Yes. What did you find? I came to Trelatska Dziesięć, where I was born. I saw the Polish prostitute without underwear, as she always sat on the stoops of our house, and she says to me, Oh, you came back? Przyszłaś powrotem, like to say other words. How come you come back? I just, I just moved my face away from her. Like she's a nobody, she doesn't exist for me. What I wanted to do is to go to a cemetery past Benjamin, a couple of kilometers. We would always walk to the Jewish cemetery where my grandfather was there. He was such a kind man, the father from my father. And I remember the number of his grave. 54, 45, let me walk there and pray on the grave. As I walked, one Polish woman goes over to me, where are you going, young girl? I says, I go to the cemetery. Ja idę na cmentarz. Don't go there, they'll kill you. Don't go there. So I didn't go there, because the Polacks, Polish people, that they will kill me. It was after the war, and then there was no still. They thought that we created the war or something. They were so jealous for the way we lived. You know what they used to do? Besides putting such, such things to our heads that hurt and couldn't get out, what they did is throwing lye on our coats that when we wore a nice fur coat, so they would, they would you know, tear our coats apart. There was jealousy for the way we lived. That's what it was. So therefore, I'm telling you that after the war now, my foot would never step to Polish earth. I love America. America is my home. Although I remember every poem in, in Polish, what I learned. But I don't like them. I cannot hate everybody. You just can't go on hating. Also, you are bleeding inside. I couldn't believe what they can do. So, Miriam, your, what did you find in your family's home when you returned? I just saw that woman, Majowa, sitting on the steps 
I didn't even go to our apartment. I just, I gave her that funny looks the way she talked to me. And uh, as I said, I was, I went away. After that, I was, I found out that some of my relatives lived not far from Benjin, was, was German, uh, like the Germans took over this part, was German land, but all now occupied by Russians. So I decided to go there and be with some friends, some that uh, I found the two sisters that lived through Auschwitz. They were so happy to embrace me. Of course, their parents were killed there. And then we found out that there's a Jewish organization from America that wants to free us, re the remaining Jews, and they want to bring us an American zone. But we have to act as Greeks, not as Polish Jews now. So what do we have to do? Just line up and don't tell anybody. There was a time when we had to line up one told the other, and we go with our, with the man, a Jewish man, who did not look Jewish at all, and he will take us through the borders. We were maybe 100 people. And as we walked through the borders, they were not exactly where the Russians stood, and you know, but a little on a side, because that was all made up probably with, with the government that we can pass by the other side. As Greeks going back, we want to go back to, to Greece. And as we walk, and the soldiers, some of the soldiers, they stay there. One spoke to the other Polish. Oh, the Russian soldier said, they speak Polish, they're not Greeks. I said, oh yeah, they're Greeks. I remember from the prayers, Jewish words. Then we come to Czechoslovakia, and the, Ch the Czech people are such nice people, down to earth. And they knew that we are Greeks, Jewish, Jews, Greeks. And after Czechoslovakia, we just, I don't know how it happened, we went to the, to the American zone. And after there, I found cousins there that was Feldapping, called by Munich. Uh, we stood over there, they called it Villa Casino, Villa Pshore, it was no villa. But we were stationed there, and we hear advertising that they want some workers for Canada. I said, I'll go, I'll go to Canada to help with children to work for a lawyer. I said, I will go. And I went with some of my friends whom I found after the war. We went to Canada. I couldn't, I couldn't speak English, you know. Oh, what, I'm, what I had to tell you what was. On the ship to Canada, I see that foreman with the, with the dead mask, the foreman, the Ukraine, on the ship. And I cannot speak English. What am I going to do? I went over there, I wanted to tell the, the people from the ship that he's a murderer, that Ukraine. I was so afraid of him. He looked on the side and, and kept, on, kept on like disappearing from me. I knew, I recognized people very well. That was him. He probably left Germany under a different name, you know, not as a Ukraine murderer. Well, don't you know, after I have been in Toronto, I went to Montreal, where I met my husband, he had cousins. On a bus, I see the same man. I was going to say to the bus driver, he murder, he killer. He took one look and he went down, went down from the bus. Like God wanted me to get him. And I couldn't speak English. He's somewhere in Canada, Montreal. If he's still alive, I would figure that he is uh, 75 years old now, something like this, or maybe 80. You don't know his name? No. He was the foreman. He was the one that took out people and shot them. There's so much 
from me to tell you what I went through. I just took everything together to tell you. All right, well, let's, um, let's go on now, and then we could go back to other questions. What, what happened after you arrived in Canada? I worked for a lawyer helping out with the children. Like I was, um, uh, there's a name for it, just for the children. They had two other maids. One was a man, a Polish man, I think, worked for them. They had, they lived like in a mansion. They had beautiful floors. He done the floors. Another woman would cook and wash and the washer, their stuff. And I was only with the children singing for them Polish songs. And how did you meet your husband? Then, being in Canada, I wrote letters to some of my friends who they did not come to Canada, but they came to New York, to Brooklyn, and I wrote, wrote to them in Polish letters. And they said, you know something? There's a nice man there. His name is Leon. Would you want to meet this man? Because you are in Canada, and he has cousins in Canada. He still, some of them died, but he still got cousins. And I says, yeah. So he sent me a picture, and I don't know. I didn't, I didn't take to him right away from the picture. So he then came to see me. And after two days, he said, you know something? Because we wrote letters, through letters, then he came to see me. He says, I think I want to marry you. I said, OK. He said, I don't have anybody. You don't have anybody. Let's get married. So then he, he went back to New York. I remained in Canada. I already was a citizen of Canada. I arrived from Europe to Canada on an on a English liner. And when then he made out papers for me, and then he took me over to the United States, and we got married. No, we got married in Canada. Then he took me. To when the did you States. arrive in the United States? What year? Do you remember? Uh, I I got married in Canada in 1949. I would say 50, 1950, because I had to wait a little by the time he brought me to the United States. And when did you leave Europe? When did you first leave Europe for Canada? 1946 or 47. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you spent two years after the war in Europe yes. living? Yes. I see. And you married and you moved to New York? Where did you move when you were married? I married uh, in Canada, and I, I moved to New York to be with my husband. And we had such hardship. We didn't have a cent. We didn't have enough clothes. And we were offered help, but we never accepted any help. Who offered you help? There were some organizations that you have to sign up and ask for help, we never did. Were these Jewish organizations? Yes. UNRA, they called that, U-N-R-A. We never did. We said, we are young, we will work. And so slowly, you know, he had some knowledge of engineering, but he had to make a living. So he heard they, are, they need a cutter, you know, to cut materials. And he said, okay, I'll be a cutter and he cut wrong the, the stuff. And he thought he's gonna be fired. And so he was so upset, because I was already pregnant with my oldest daughter, who is our attorney now. And, um, but they kept him. They liked him. They just taught him not to do it anymore like this. What we went through, my God. We could hardly pay our rent. He took work home while I was pregnant from the factory where he was a cutter because I learned during the war to do some sewing mm -hmm. that I will sew and do other things to help out. But I constantly cried. Believe me, my three daughters, they, were, they are great, right? One is attorney, 
one has master's degree in administration, the other one has uh, Ava that's going to play with me. She went to Berkeley College, she's a, a voice teacher and also a singer. I have great daughters, but you know, although I never spoke with them anything about the war, but they saw me cry and pray to God, I still do. After so many years in the morning, I said, please God, do you please listen to my pleas and punish all those what they did to my family? Not for me, what they did to me, I survived. But please, let them live a life of torture, what they did to us. Every morning, every night, my husband walks into the room. He says, you at it again? I said, yes, that keeps me alive, Leon. Besides, you know what I do to myself. Anytime I'm upset, I'll grab bread and eat it. I said, I'm a good performer. I have no right, you know, to be overweight. That's all Why? stress, S terrible stress. My children are really educated, but Holocaust children. And look, now I go out doing music with Ava, charities. Both of us received the golden keys to my, from a mayor of Miami Beach. I was nominated of Spirit of Excellence by the Herald for doing my volunteer work. I have been called to the Phil Donahue show for playing for the disabled, and I have a video of it. He's a great man. And many other awards. I have a little suitcase with so many awards what Ava and I do in charitable work. But we also uh, perform professionally, and we are loved doing that. What, did your mother teach you anything that you're teaching My your children? My mother took me along when she went as a nurse to work. So I play my mandolin. I was a young girl, and they loved us. My mother sang. I had such a talent of playing even before I learned my notes. All the rich songs, Italian songs, by now I still remember songs going back to 1939. Italian, Spanish, Polish, Hebrew, Jewish. Does we are called international melodies. Does your music help you with your pain? Yes. yes. But when I come home, when I perform, every, I tell them jokes and they are laughing, and, but when, and I play music, and Ava sings for them. That's how we were nominated, you know? You don't get nominations just like this. People write in letters, and you have to prove what you did. And so now mother took me along as she worked for the, for the sick. I take Ava along with me. In the beginning, you know, she was busy, busy, a young girl. Now she comes along with me. We still do that. Do you think you'll talk to your children more now about your experiences? No, no. It's too painful. They saw me crying all the time. I don't know how they survive, but I assure you that my trauma lives with them. I assure you. My daughters would say, speak to us, please, mother, tell us. I said, no. I would like to tell the Germans and the Poles what they did to us. I don't want to say it to you. But be proud. Be proud to be good. My mother told me goodness. She gave to the poor beside her work. She gave clothing. Now that we had here yeah, the hurricane, Ava and I worked all the time you know, with the people. That's how you get awarded. Also, they don't pay you money, but they pay you in honors. You're a lucky lady. Uh, Miriam? Yes. I'd like to go back and ask you if there's any other stories you'd like to tell, anything you remember, maybe from the time at Auschwitz that you think is, you'd like to share now? In Auschwitz, we just waited, you know, to, to be cremated, to be murdered if we cannot work anymore, because they didn't give us any clothing, any food. 
And I told you the skeletons that we saw in, uh, in front of the barracks, they were just skeletons, but people died as people. Where is their flesh? Just skin and s holes in the skin and skeletons. Something I never forget. Like starved to death. Did, did you all try to help one another? Or comfort one another at yeah. all? Yeah. There is a, was an older woman in my barracks. And she would tell me, come on, your mother. She knew my mother and Hava when they went in. She says, what did your mother tell you? Your mother told you to survive and tell the world. So you don't complain now. And I used to sew things for the other prisoners. We did it from, from little rags because I learned how to sew. So the times were very hard. When somebody was really skinny, they lined us up and they guessed them. That's what they did to my family. They guessed them. What did you Always all before my eyes is that picture like they probably threw in my mother and have a, with other people t in those gas chambers and they, how they were murdered. This is something you will never forget. You live with the trauma, look how strong people can be, especially Jews, because what they went through through the lives, with persecutions, how they can survive something like this. No wonder that some say it never happened because they wouldn't survive. If those who say that are not Jewish, they wouldn't survive. We were strong. We, be we believed that we must survive. That is the strength of a Jew, because why were we murdered? What did we do wrong? Why was it so wrong to be a Jew? Some of my friends put on a cross during the war. I never put one on. One of my cousins um, told the people he was a priest. And that's how he survived that war. He died by now. He wore an outfit of a priest. He told them he were not he was not Jewish, but of course they would know if he was Jewish. You know how they could tell a Jew, because Jews were circumcised. There's just so much that I could talk about. Well, so go ahead. Much. Go ahead. Talk. Oh. I don't know where to start. Life was not easy for us because we had to, our families were murdered and we, my husband and I, we had to start from scratch, you know, and to raise a family, it was quite difficult for us. But we did it with honors and all our children are educated, although we are still paying for their school. And um, the taxes went up and I worry about my beautiful little home, if I can keep it or not. You mentioned something earlier, uh, actually mentioned twice, about the death head marks on the Gestapo. Yes. Could you explain to me about that? Yeah, well, those were a special, a special a kind of Germans that they were SS Gestapo, that they were, had the right, without asking anybody, to execute anybody they wanted, kill. Just take them out, line them up, and kill them. And that's what they did. When they arrived uh, to Benjin, probably to the other cities, that's what they did. They just round them up. They showed that they mean business. And you know what else I forgot to tell you? In Auschwitz, there was a group of gypsies. They played violin so beautifully. One day, all we saw, they liquidated this barrack and we saw smoke. They just killed them. They just killed every gypsy. They didn't give them a chance to work even. They killed them. 
Do you remember your barracks number? No, I don't. Could you picture the barracks? If I picture the barracks, sure. It still, it still is in my eyes. I remember, but I would never want to go there in my life. I went through. I tell you, this is impossible to do to people what the Germans did. It is impossible for somebody who gave such great uh, uh, conductors and uh, doctors, great physicians. It's impossible. What can? Okay. We'll stop for a moment. Rule number four. Okay, tape four. Miriam? Yes. While you were in Auschwitz, you were selected to play music. Yes. Tell me who you played for and what you did. Yeah. We played for soldiers. You know, in barracks for soldiers. They, they entertained them with our music. We were all like professional musicians. Although I was so young, but we were all professional, like uh, violin players. They were older than I am. Violin, guitar, banjos, and we entertained the soldiers. We were told to do it. So at least we didn't stay outside in the frost while we spent the time playing music there. So many of us maybe this way survive. But you know what else I want to tell you? A mother and two daughters survived. We were friendly together. Then in Poland, in Benjamin, I meet her. I says, oh, you are with your mother and sister. She said, no. While we traveled, she says, on those trains, we stopped in a, on a farm place, and my mother and sister had their, their heads cut off by the poles. And I was hiding, she says, and I survived. I said, oh my God, after you survived Auschwitz, such a death camp, how did that happen? She says, well, that's what the Poles did to, to my mother and sister. I was surprised. I think I, I don't know how she, how she could tell me that, how she could take it. That's what they did. That's why they told me, don't go to the, on the cemetery, because Poles will kill you there on the way. I had to walk miles. Do you believe that was all keen jealousy for the way we lived? We lived with Poles in my building. So I could tell you what was going on in their houses, how drunk their fathers got and beat them all up, the wives and the children. And we lived so peaceful. And my mother always baked and... Did your family ever discuss leaving Poland before the war? Yes. My sister Hava got acquainted with a kibbutz. I'm so glad you brought this up. And she wanted to go to Israel with her friends. This one that was a poetress, Hava. And she waited for her next to be able, you know, there was a, a time for waiting because the Poles didn't let us out. And some of her friends made it to Israel, but she never made it. Did your parents want to leave? We wanted to leave the, any place away from the Poles that persecuted us. But where would you go? There was no place to go. If they would only let us into a different country, would, we would leave everything behind and go. We're just stuck, ready to just to be destroyed. Do you have anything from your family? Do you have anything left? No, just a few pictures What the boys that wanted to marry my sister Regina. They were two young people in the ghetto. They, you know, they loved each other. And after the war, he gave me her pictures. 
and he had a new wife who was pregnant with a child. Miriam, I, I have a feeling that there's many stories that you're not telling. Yes, there are some private stories what the soldiers did to us. That it's, they were different, difficult times. That it's not necessary to reveal. We were all beautiful young girls. Do you think it was harder for women yes. than for men? Yes, but they, they would murder other on the streets we saw mostly all Jewish people, male, lying dead. But in the camps, there was no difference, girls or male, everybody was killed in the camps. On the streets, whoever had a little beard, you know, they knew those are Jews. The Poles told them, see the Jew, Jew, and they murdered them. Every time I go out from the house and I see dead people, wouldn't it be frightening to a 13, 14 year old girl? Why we are, I couldn't kill a fly. What was going on? Did you know of any Jewish resistance? Yes, we heard about them. The ones that knew uh, for sure what the Germans were up to, they were hiding in the woods, joining the Russians, you know? They were not just Jews, they were Poles, Ukrainians, people that were, some of them, nice people. Yeah. Was there any Jewish leadership in your community? During the war? Or bef at the beginning of the war, before the Before there was um, just synagogues. But during the war, the Germans organized a place called Gemeinde, that the Jews helped, you know, bring Jews to camps. They were the ones that knew where a Jew lived and everything, and they helped, they also helped the Germans, because they were Jewish and they worked with the Germans. But they, of course, they didn't know that, that their people are sent to be killed. They didn't know. The Germans told them, you know, uh, round up your Jewish people, and so they, they did. Did you know any of these people? I hear that some of them have been given a very bad time in Israel after the war, that helped the Germans to round up the Jewish people. Of course, it was not their fault, they didn't know. And there were also a couple of couples, Jewish women, husky women, that they were getting extra bread or what, otherwise they would be skinny like us. So they also helped sort of with us, to round us up. They were from different countries, from all over Europe. Okay. Is there anything else you would like to share? Believe me, my stories are very long. If I want to sit down, I could write a book. But perhaps, ask me, what else can I tell you? It was, we lived during the war with such a panic because we knew already that they have been taking away our brothers and sisters. They said to work, to relocation, but we sensed that something was wrong. For sure we didn't know. Till this man came and he said, he's from Auschwitz. And he told us, do you know? He came to the ghetto, they murdered us Jews. We thought he's, he's telling us a fib, but that couldn't be possible. What can the Jews do today to help each other? Today. To prevent this today? What do we do today? We have to be strong and not to believe, you know, people like, uh, you know, murderers who are up to something bad. The ones uh, like skinheads or other ones, those are all people that have no jobs and they are jealous. And that brings anti-Semitism. Jealousy does that. Why other people live in such a peace and they don't have anything? Because they don't want to work. They just want to take it away like the Germans did from us, the Germans and all the others that collaborated with them. So 
So what do you teach your children? What do we teach all of our young children today? I teach them to be good. I teach them not to hate, but be aware. Be a Jew, don't be afraid. Be strong, because look, from a death camp like I was in, somehow I survived. And, and you are so great, you do things for other people, like my mother did, continue doing that. And that's how we live. Thank you, Grandma. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ava Tract, and I'm the youngest daughter of Miriam Tract and Leon Tract, both Holocaust survivors. I'd like to say that my life has deeply been affected by being a Holocaust child, and also that I'm very grateful to Steven Spielberg for bringing this back into awareness. This should never happen again. I'd like to dedicate the song to Steven Spielberg's mother. It's called Mama Left. like to perform for you is an old gypsy melody called Bulgar. Thank you. 
original song, my father, Leon Tracht, and he will be singing a song in Hebrew called Veulai. Next. my father, my beloved father, Zelik Fireman. Place, this picture was taken in Poland and Benjin. It was taken before the war, a few years before the war. In the middle is my beloved sister Regina, who perished, who was murdered in Bergen-Belsen by the German Nazis. And to the left, is her boyfriend, whom she wanted, she was to marry, and he gave me after the war the pictures. His name. His name I don't remember very well. Okay. But the place was after the war in Bergen-Belsen. This picture is of me. My beloved husband, Leon, who is a sweet gentleman, and me. That's how we got married. Those are the pictures. It was taken in Montreal, Canada, in 1948. This is me. My name is Miriam. 
This is me taken right during the war, right before we went to the ghetto. That was 1943, I believe. This is a picture of me and my three daughters and my husband. The first one to the left is Ava, who goes with me on concerts for charities. The second one is my daughter, the attorney, Terry. The third one is Vanessa, who sings beautifully, and my husband, Leon, who sings beautifully, and me. This picture was taken on a ship in 1994. The two girls are my grandchildren by my daughter, Vanessa. To the left is um, Dory, whose name is after my mother-in-law, who was murdered. And to the right is Helena, who is named after my daughter, who was murdered from, by the Nazis. Their name is Dory and Helena Cohen. It was taken in 1993. Those are my two grandchildren by my older daughter, the attorney, Terry. Their name is Jason Bogart and Mimi Bogart. This was taken in 1992. This is a barb that the Poles used to put into our Jewish girl's hair, and we had long braids, and it was really difficult to comb the hair. It hurt it, and we had our mothers to cut this out. This is the tattoo, 74,362, which the German Nazis imprinted on me in Auschwitz.